Good afternoon, everyone. This is Alan Heisterkamp at the University of Northern Iowa. I direct the Center for Violence Prevention here on campus, and I'm pleased that you could join us today for our webinar on men's accountability. We have a few more folks, participants that we're actually joining right now, So, but I do wanna begin with some housekeeping items and some, some general introductions before I introduce our moderator and facilitator for today's webinar. I'm pleased and honored to be a part of the University of Northern Iowa who um, has been a, a true partner in the webinar series for the North American Men Engaged Network thus far. This is our third webinar that we are hosting from the university. And a special thanks to Matthew Tenney, who is a part of our university technical assistance team, um, who will be providing and supporting our uh, webinar today. On an earlier chat message, he sent out to you um, a comment that if, if you anytime have a question or an issue regarding your connection to the webinar, please chat uh, in the chat box, which you can find at the top of your screen, and Matthew will um, work as, as quickly as he can to help problem solve and uh, address the issue. So again, uh, appreciate the university for allowing us to host uh, this webinar and look forward to our conversation today. At the top of your screen, you'll notice there are two tabs um, to be mindful of during this webinar. The first one is the Q&A tab, whereby as a participant, you uh, can, can post a comment or pose a question uh, that the panelists will be able to, number one, A, respond to you via a text uh, message back to you directly, or if the question is pertaining to the, the broader content of the webinar, then our facilitator and our panelists uh, will probably be able to weave it into their discussion and the narrative at, at the time. So we do want to respond to questions. We do ask that you um, consider posing questions and comments throughout the uh, webinar today, and we will work to uh, respond either directly or indirectly with regards to the text. There's a chat box, a, a chat, chat tab at the top of your screen as well, and that the chat uh, only is only viewed by or, or seen by the panelists on today's webinar. So you can send personal messages or a, a message, but only those uh, on the panelists um, today will be able to see that, that chat. <laughs> We are going to be tweeting uh, during the webinar today, and that will be hashtag NAMEN. That's hashtag N-A-M-E-N, M-A-N-E-N -E -E today. So with that brief introduction, it's my pleasure to introduce to you um, our facilitator for today's webinar, um, Omar Paul. Omar? Yes. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Um, and uh, many thanks um, to Matthew and the University of Northern Iowa for providing us um, the technical capacity to have this conversation, this very important conversation um, that I would like to welcome all of our viewers to. Uh, in brief, the topic of today's discussion is conceptualizing and implementing accountability in men's gender equity efforts. Um, this is part of a continuing dialogue that uh, all of our uh, panelists will will um, provide uh, their experience and uh, and work uh, on on which. Um, so um, that being said, I uh, represent uh, Muslims for Progressive Values. I'm the UN uh, United Nations representative based in New York in New York. Um, and uh, I'll spare the introduction to my organization as uh, one of the panelists, um, Shafran, is my colleague, and so she'll speak more about our work uh, on uh, engaging men um, and faith leaders for gender equality. Um, so I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce our panelists to you all. Um, so we have uh, here first, um, oh, I can actually share the bios with everyone so we can all read along. Uh, do that uh, very quickly, but I will read a short sort of synopsis of the bio. So there we are. Um, so at the top, we have uh, Emiliano Diaz de Leon. Um, he is a, men en men engagement, a men's engagement specialist. Um, he has more than a decade of experience uh, working for uh, several domestic and sexual violence centers across Texas. Um, 
and in 2008 during the Texas Association Against Sexual Assaults, um, and has provided training and technical assistance, uh, primary prevention of sexual violence to uh, rape prevention education, RPE, grantees around the states, and has also founded and coordinates the Mobilizing Men Task Force, uh, presently serving on the University of Texas uh, Voices Against Violence Masculinity Steering Committee meeting. So welcome, Emiliano. Um, and uh, going down the list, we have here uh, Shafron Sonnefeld, who is the Global Advocacy Director of Muslims for Progressive Values. Um, Shafron, uh, so MPV is a faith-based human rights organization um, promoting gender equality and women's empowerment. Um, we do uh, LGBTQI advocacy, um, freedom of expression and freedom of and from religion and belief. Um, and, and Shafran is the co-creator actually of an initiative that she'll be talking about more today. It's called Imams for She, um, which is uh, the initiative to engage Imams uh, Muslim faith leaders in uh, advocating for gender equality and women's empowerment. Um, and uh, she's also very keen on, on championing women's rights and empowerment through um, the said initiative uh, and has worked for uh, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom and was the lead author of a report called Through the Lens of Civil Society, a summary report on the public submissions for the Global Study on Women, Peace and Security. And she has a master's degree in international law from the University of, I'm going to mispronounce this chef, so forgive me, uh, Maastricht in the Netherlands. Um, uh, moving on, we have uh, Chuck Derry, who has worked uh, to end men's violence against women since 1983. So we have a seasoned uh, panelist here. He's the founder of the um, Gender Violence Institute. Um, and which has provided training and technical assistance to implement uh, strategic intervention and, and primary prevention initiatives. Um, and Chuck is also a founding a, a member of the North American Men Engaged Network, which is the uh, constituency that we, all of our organizations are members of or work for directly, um, and is also a member of the Global Men Engage Alliance Governing Board. Um, so welcome, Chuck. And uh, now I'll, I want to start the conversation with a question that I think is is very important in this in this context. So, let's stop sharing that. Um, and that and that question is how do we define accountability uh, when we're talking about it um, in 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 terms of gender equality uh, and um, in terms of engaging men in this discussion. So, um, the first question is 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 then um, you know. Uh, how do the panelists, how would you define accountability in terms of men's work to reduce uh, and end um, violence and misogyny, uh, especially um, violence and misogyny perpetrated by patriarchy um, against women? So I think we'll, we can start with uh, Shaf, if that's okay. So Shaf, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Omer. Thank you so much for having me on, on this panel. It's a great honor and a pleasure to, to be uh, participating in this. Uh, to add on to what Omer is saying, uh, just explain about Muslims for Progressive Values. We have uh, consultative status at the United Nations, and the work that we do uh, is to embody and be an effective voice of traditional Quranic ideals of human dignity, egalitarianism, compassion, and social justice. So we've been a prominent voice in countering radi radicalism and extremism within communities, and then also hate and misunderstanding uh, of Islam by fostering intercultural and uh, interfaith dialogues on a local and on a global platform. So MPV has established and nurtures vibrant progressive Muslim communities um, around the world by creating opportunities for religious discourse, volunteer and community activities, and cultural uh, events, bringing together the arts, spirituality, and social activism. And given our consultative status at the United Nations, we provide advocacy work uh, on a high policy level at the UN in order to promote inclusive and tolerant understandings of Islam based on uh, human rights, justice, and peace. So in terms of accountability, I, I, I'm gonna share my screen uh, with you right now, um, if all goes well, of course. Oh, there we go. Uh, I have a Prezi that hopefully will work. <laughs> I 
There we go. So as I mentioned, we are a faith-based human rights organization and Omer already covered our focus area. So I'm going to fast forward into um, accountability on a, uh, an international level. Uh, on an international level, we hold accountable state and non-state actors who use Islam in perpetrating human rights abuses, either in states failure to implement and enforce international human rights law um, uh, as a result of reservations that they may hold in the name of Sharia law, or in uh, their laws that criminalize alleged acts of uh, blasphemy, apostasy, and homosexuality. So we do this by monitoring and collecting grassroots information in uh, Muslim majority states around the world and taking such information to develop stakeholder reports and campaigns uh, for the universal periodic review process of the United Nations, but also through other high-level policy uh, advocacy strategies such as panel discussions, statements, and through quiet diplomacy. And in terms of accountability on a grassroots level, um, we hold accountable members of our Muslim uh, community at large for discriminatory behavior that they carry out towards, for instance, artists, religious minorities, members of the LGBTQI community, and discriminatory behavior towards women and girls. So in terms of women's rights, we advocate against all forms uh, of violence against women and girls and promote uh, women's rights uh, the women right to take leadership roles in their community, including uh, to mixed uh, congregational prayers, which is unfortunately still taboo in many Muslim communities. So alongside other feminists, we debunk misogynist interpretations uh, of the Quran and Islamic traditions. And one major project that I'll be talking about is the Imam Rashi uh, initiative. So when I take a step back and when I look at accountability, when I first looked up uh, the definition of accountability in, in a dictionary, I found that accountability, as you'll see, is a quality of, or state of being accountable, especially having an obligation or willingness to accept responsibility or to account for one's actions. So digesting that a little bit and maybe taking a moment to reflect on that, to me, accountability starts with education. It starts, starts with understanding what your rights are, understanding at what point they're taken away, and then learning to whom uh, to call on for accountability, whether it's the perpetrators themselves or the uh, protectors or enforcers of those rights who acted neg uh, negligently. Further, reflecting on accountability and then also the need to understand what your rights are, it reminded me of a, uh, of a quote by Malala, where she has said, um, extremists have shown what frightens them the most, a girl with a book. So again, accountability starts with knowledge, education, and awareness raising, particularly speaking from the perspective of a, of a, of a woman. Uh, knowing when my rights are being violated, knowing when my peers' rights are being violated. And for this reason, um, it's important to learn more about your rights, when they're violated and what action points to take to seek justice. So for this reason, uh, MPV, Muslims for Progressive Values, is quite big on producing accessible resources such as infographics or short videos, lecture series, to simplify complicated religious lingo that we get to deal with as a faith-based human rights organization, but then also international human rights law. And we produce this for civil society, for lay audience, but also for policymakers and religious leaders, because ultimately to enhance accountability for women's rights, you need to be aware of what, what we're talking about. What rights are we talking about? So thank you for that. And I'll stop sharing my screen now. Oh, you're muted, Omer. I'm, my apologies. I was muted there. Uh, so I think that was a great um, uh, uh, sort of uh, definition uh, of accountability as it um, applies at the international level and, and what sort of mechanisms uh, exist uh, within international human rights law. Um, so that is one, one, I think, one dimension of, of the, the dynamic of accountability. So... Um, I'd like to now call upon uh, Emiliano if you could talk uh, a little bit about what accountability uh, means to you 
um, and and how the this definition that was just provided um, informs it or resonates or is it may be different. Thank you. This is Emiliano Diaz Leon. I am the men's engagement sexual, uh, specialist with the Texas Association Against Sexual Assault uh, out of Austin, Texas. So I'm I'm really grateful. Uh, for being on today's webinar and, and engaging in a conversation around accountability. So the Texas Association Against Sexual Assault is, uh, is the coalition that represents all the rape crisis centers in Texas. And so we have about 86 centers um, around the state that work directly with victims of sexual violence. And so one of the things that I do here is provide training and technical assistance to specifically RP grantees who are doing primary prevention around sexual violence uh, with an emphasis on engaging boys and men and um, work with them directly by providing them ongoing technical assistance and training. And so, um, you know, in the context of that work, we're really trying to help rape crisis centers uh, really support engaged men in their local communities um, around the state. And that includes some, um, you know, men who are, who, who are staff with their organizations or volunteers, uh, men who are on their board of directors, uh, men who are donors, um, men who they engage on a daily basis around preventing sexual violence. And so our role is to really um, support them and um, help them hold those men at a local level, um, hold those men accountable at a local level, um, and provide them with sort of the capacity building that they need in order to do that. So what are some of the skills that they need in order to engage in those conversations with the men who, who are actively engaged with their organization? Um, and how do they hold those men accountable? What are the, uh, the through their programmatic work, especially around prevention? And so um, I wanna make sure that I wanna share my um, contact information with folks so that um, if, Folks want to um, if folks want to reach out to us uh, for support or just to learn about the work that we're doing, I want to make sure you have my contact information and um, were able to reach out to me. And um, if there was very specific questions, especially from folks who are working at a coalition level who are trying to engage local communities around this particular issue, and so I, I, this is something that we're constantly engaging with uh, folks through our. Um, our network called the, the Mobilizing Men Task Force. And so this is a network of individuals and organizations and institutions who are engaging men around sexual violence prevention in their local community. And, and as part of a network, which we've had for the last eight years, that's really an opportunity to support and to uh, provide them with the training and the capacity building that they need in order to do um, effective prevention work in their local communities. But we keep on hearing from, from folks in those communities that accountability is sort of uh, is an ongoing issue. And so they're trying to engage in ways to hold the men and boys that are participating in the programming accountable. And so um, I want to encourage folks who, who are thinking about this issue to, to reach out to us and to learn about how we've sort of uh, been engaging in those conversations for the, for the last eight years around this particular issue. Um, and, and again, that, you know, for us, it, it really requires uh, conver uh, sort of ongoing conversations with prevention educators as well as um, men in those local communities. And so TASA has the capacity to go around and engage in those conversations uh, with folks um, at a statewide level uh, as well as at a, as at a local level. Um, and, the, you know, the impact around this particular issue, I think, um, has been effective because, again, we're able to bring the resources that we have at a statewide level to folks at a local level um and engage with them um, in these conversations um, and provide them sort of ongoing training and technical assistance not just around this issue but around a variety of issues around uh, when it comes to engaging men and so I've, I've been doing a lot of um reflecting on this particular issue so one of the things that um i wanted to share with you um was, in, was a blog post that, that I came across, and hopefully folks at, at this point have seen it, but um, Ashley Mayer, um, who, who wrote this particular piece, so you can go to her website and um, download it from her blog. But it was a powerful piece that I've, I've been really reflecting on since she, she, she posted it back in September um, around um, another engaging men workshop, another abusive experience in terms of her perspective, her experience 
around experiencing abuse and and in the context of uh, a workshop about engaging men um and just the response that she received from um and didn't see uh the accountability that she was looking for in that space um and so it's a really powerful and important piece i think that uh that i've been reflecting on for some time and i hope that others will sort of um take a look at it and really share it um, and think about it, how it impacts their work, um, especially those who, who do this as part of their work. If this is part of your professional work of engaging men, if you're part of an organization or institution, um, you know, how, how, do we, how do we engage in these conversations and spaces that we, that, that we share with, uh, with women and especially uh, women of color? Uh, um, and so I think this, this really uh, forced me to, to really reflect on this particular issue for this webinar. So thank you. Uh, excellent. Um, thank you uh, so much, Emiliano, for that um, definition. I think, you know, Shaf's um, uh, 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 perspective on this was very um, international and, and cemented and concrete um, in structures and institutions. And what your uh, definition alluded to is the very um, sort of behavioral and, and grassroots um, uh, connotation or dimension that accountability uh, and education uh, for accountability um, uh, uh, speaks to. Um, so, so Chuck, I give the floor now to you um, to add your uh, definition to this mix. Um, so the floor is yours. Yeah. Hi. Yes. Thank you. Uh, great stuff. Um, one of the things I remember uh, when I was 17 years old, and so I was that was like uh, 1973 or something like that. And I was it was a nice summer day, and I was sitting outside, and I was in in those days the feminists were all called uh, women's libbers and that kind of thing, and they're burning their bras and stuff, and and it was in the news and whatnot. And I'm 17, I'm hanging out, I got long hair, and I'm just chilling, and uh, I think to myself for the first time, I thought to myself what would it mean to me personally if men and women were really equal? What would it mean? And within two minutes, I had the answer. I'd have to give some stuff up. And I thought to myself, nah, I don't think so, you know. Mm -mm. And, you know, I didn't, like, grow another head. I made this very moral decision not to care. Uh, I had a better understanding now. My awareness had risen. I had better understanding what a great deal was to be a guy, so that was good. I didn't grow this other head like I wasn't some weirdo now because I said, nah, I'm just going to ignore it. I was just like other guys. I was a good guy. We hung up with uh, girls and boys, hung out together and whatnot. But I was really aware of my privilege. And then 10 years later, at 27, I started doing this work, and I started seeing the foundations of, of uh, sexism. That's men's violence against women. When all else fails, the economics, the intimidation, the violence works. Um, and I really um, started then to have to question myself. I started working in a feminist women's organization. I thought it wasn't very sexist when I went in there. Then I found out my big toe was sexist. You know, it wasn't just this attitude I had, but it was who I was. It was part of my identity, how I thought about women being inferior and subordinate to men and women as sexual objects, all these things. And then what are the privileges that I had because of that? And I started to see the institutionalized sexism and my own individual sexism as I began working with men who batter. And as I began working with the criminal justice system who wasn't doing anything about men's violence against women, right? So you see this amazing kind of life that women were living with, right? Um, so the biggest question for me and the foundation of this work is accountability. And the biggest question for me was, am I willing to give some of this stuff up? Because if I'm going to be accountable and we're really going to have gender equality, I am going to have to give some stuff up. I'm not going to be able to just relax while she's cleaning the house or I'm the next in my job, uh, my workplace, the next, uh, if it's really equal, racially equal and gender equal, the next advancement is not going to be me. I'm not going to, I'm a straight white guy. I'm not going to get it if it's really equal because I've been, really appreciating the privileges of being a white guy. And so some of the accountability piece is that we have to start, how do we walk our talk, right? And I was looking at the Men Engage Global Alliance. They have a toolkit, and I'll show you a link to it later, um, but an accountability toolkit for pro-feminist men's organizations, and they list accountability meaning uh, critically aware of one's own power and privilege. That's the first piece. Being open to constructive criticism, right? 
being responsible for one's actions. And this is a little bit what Emiliano, you were talking about the gentleman that Ashley is referring to at this conference. Are you responsible for your actions and open to the criticism, right? Um, for following through with what we say we're going to do. Will we really do it? Taking action to address behavior or beliefs that go against the men engaged principles by individuals or groups inside or outside the workplace or in your uh, community. And then openly acknowledging any harm caused and developing any harm caused, opening, acknowledging that harm that's caused by your behaviors and then developing and implementing solutions to make amends, which I think is a huge piece as well and talk about it later is how do we make a, amends for the harm that we created? Whether we intended to do that harm or not is immaterial. Is how, if we created harm, how do we make amends for that and make sure it doesn't happen again. So I think this accountability, as more and more men globally are coming to the table in partnership with women, this accountability piece is key. And we talk a lot about it, but I'm not sure we walk it as much as we need to. Thanks. Absolutely, uh, and thank you, um, um, Chuck, for that, that dose of uh, realism, um, because it is uh, very much so the case that um, you know, dialogue is very important, and I think we understand that having this space to have this conversation is is, is crucial. Um, yet we might get caught up in cycles of dialogue as opposed to actually, uh, uh, yeah, like you said, just walking the uh, the talk. Um, so, uh, but I think we've all done uh, amazing things um, to that end, and I think many of us are are walking the talk. It's just a matter of of. Uh, uh, you know, engaging um, the broader community, our broader uh, constituencies and networks uh, in doing the same. Um, so to, to that end, um, I think actually if we can go in reverse order this time and talk about some of the initiatives that our organizations um, are employing, uh, either uh, uh, locally or uh, nationally or internationally, um, uh, to really uh, walk this talk. So. Uh, Chuck, if you would like to um, explain a little bit more about uh, in any any in initiative that your organization um, uh, has uh, uh, begun or, or uh, jump started or spearheaded to this end. Um. Well, I think there's a, a number of things. Um, so, yeah, there's a number of things. Um, here's where I'd start, and I'm looking at this question about how do we act and behave accountably in our work. Is that kind of what we're where you're moving to, Omer? Sure. Yeah, we could absolutely. And because that inv involves institutional uh, initiatives, right, as well as individual kind of impact, right. And, and I think um, you know one of the, when I think about individual impact, I think about that I need to listen to women. I mean, I was taught to never listen to women, and now I'm into feminist women's organization at 27 and I need to listen to women, right? I need to be aware of how much time I'm taking up in the room. So you've got, uh, there's eight people in the room, there's two guys and they're taking up, you know, 50% of the time. You know, how do I bring my privilege and power into the room? How do I acknowledge women's reality? How do they, you know, what needs to happen for them to look at me, listen to me and they go, oh, he gets it. And then when I do get it, what does that mean to me? How do I change? Like I remember first starting and having conversations with feminist women who are trying to get police to arrest and court to arrest men who batter. And we were talking about sexism and I was saying, well, guys can't cry. And then we debate. And luckily they were very nice to me. They were willing to debate with me. I said, yeah, but guys can't cry. You know, sexism's hard on guys too. And then the woman who owned the apartment that we're in said, Chuck, you see that great big chest of drawers over there? huge oak chest of drawers. She said, you know what I do when I come home? I push that in front of the door. This is right next to her front door. I said, oh, and then another woman said, yeah, Chuck, you know what I do? I do this. And the women all went around and said, this is what they do to deal with sexism. And then I went, oh, okay, now I get it. Whether I can cry or not is minimal compared to the what they live with, what the injustices they live with. So I have to understand that if I'm gonna work in this field, that there are some disadvantages to men around sexism, but they're minimal. The, the benefits far outweigh the disadvantages. And how am I accountable to those benefits? And how do I just wear them on my sleeve? It's not like I can take off my privileges like a coat. I have them all the time. So how do I attend to them? How do I use them to um, subvert patriarchy? How do I use them to use my influence to support gender justice? How do I engage feminist partners? Like if I'm being challenged or I'm considering challenging other organizations or individuals, how do I talk to my feminist partners and women and those who are most harmed by oppression 
because they, they are living this experience and they're going to be most impacted. So I need to talk. It's critical that I speak with them to get their feedback about how to go forward. It's the same thing when I'm thinking about taking a position as a network, Profoundest Men's Network or an organization. I'm taking a position. I'm going to do an action. I really need to talk with my allies, those, again, who are most impacted by institutional oppression to see how does this look to you? Does this make sense? Like when we started the Minnesota Men's Action Network, the first thing we did in the state in Minnesota was do advocacy focus groups. We did seven advocacy focus groups around the state because we want women to get a chance to check us out. We wanted to get their feedback. We wanted to show them what we we're saying. We wanted to know if it was going to be harmful or helpful. And also we want to talk about the challenges, the opportunities, and the threats of male involvement in this movement. And, and how can we do this effectively? And I think basically then taking that information and acting on it. And how do we using our collective power, either in our home or in our work or in our faith communities, to you know locker rooms, hunting shacks, wherever we are, uh, to make change and living by the principles of gender justice. Absolutely. Um, so thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Emiliano. If you'd like to uh, pick up um, from where Chuck left off. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I, I, I want to acknowledge that, um, you know, I think this is a really important conversation that we're having, uh, that we're continuing. Um, and I want to acknowledge Ashley's contribution to this conversation. She was on a previous webinar uh, that Nateman hosted, and I would encourage folks to, to go and uh, to, to, to review that previous webinar. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge I didn't, I, I didn't reach out to her and, and let her know that I was planning on sharing that on today's webinar. And so... Um, definitely one of the things I, I should have did, and I think it's an important part to acknowledge in terms of my own accountability around sharing her material and her work on this particular issue. And so I apologize for that. And um, I, I think it's really profound to really look at, you know, women's experiences. And, and, and um, for me, again, this piece that, Kate, that Ashley put out and that other women have put out um, that they've shared uh, through social media and uh, to me directly in terms of their own stories. Um, I think are, are really important to reflect on and for us as men to, to, to think about and to um, and engage in a critical uh, conversation with ourselves um, and with other men around this particular issue and with women um, and, and, and be really present and um, acknowledge those experiences that, that, are, that are profound and painful and sometimes violent and abusive. Um, especially uh, among men who, who, are, who are engaging in the work. So these are our peers and our colleagues who are engaging in this behavior. And I think uh, that I think is, is, is really painful to, to acknowledge and to, to hear those stories from, from women and especially women of color uh, who have experienced violence and abuse at the hands of men who, who are supposed to be an engaging, uh, who are, are supposed to be doing engaging men work. And I think we really have to, um, really take a hard look at ourselves and uh, really reflect on our own behavior and um, how we are engaging in those spaces that uh, we are very fortunate to be in um, as, as men. Um, and to acknowledge that, you know, for most of the time we were invited by women to, to be in those spaces. Uh, we are invited by women to, to do this work. Um, and, and I think we have to, uh, at least for me, I think it's it's sort of that ongoing self-reflection and really acknowledging the, the the mistakes that I make along the way, and that I make real uh, efforts to uh, to learn from 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 those mistakes and to acknowledge them and to, um, to, to 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 move forward um, with that sort of in mind. But at the same time, be open to allowing myself to be accountable. Uh, to women who are engaged in the work and um, to, to, to make myself accessible. And so when I, uh, you know, when somebody approaches me or has, uh, you know, or is, you know, uh, feedback for me uh, regarding my behavior or something that I might have said, or, um, you know, I think Chuck said really well in terms of how we are trained and how we um, are conditioned as men um, to think of um, and, and to engage with women. And I think we have to be really conscious of that and work to undo that those privileges um but i will acknowledge that that's that that's ongoing for me i i'm not i, I think that uh, in the work that i do with folks around the state um there's a lot of work that men have to do when they come 
uh, when they come to a local program and, and when they either invited or uh, they join prevention efforts at a local level is that we want to ensure that those men are willing to engage in a process of, of transformation and that uh, and acknowledge that they have work to do and that we want to support those those rape crisis centers in doing that work and so um, but but I think it's it, it really is difficult work. This is not easy, I think, in terms of this issue of accountability, because it can be painful, it can feel personal. Um, right. And at the same time, it, I think it is the responsibility, it's part of the responsibility of the work that, that, that we're doing um, as men with other men. Um, and, and again, I think it's, this is part of that uh, ongoing conversation and dialogue about accountability. Absolutely. Um, and, and thank you for that very uh, uh, count, uh, candid um, uh, ex explanation or uh, answer um, there. I think that's very that's um, very important and something that I think a lot of people would be keen on uh, um, on, uh, on, ex uh, on seeing, uh, especially if, uh, you know, we're men and we're saying that you know, we are uh, men for gender equality. Um, there, there is a a very personal sentiment uh, uh, and that needs to, I think, come out and that needs to be, um, you know, it, uh, clearly expressed in the work that we do um, for on this topic. So that being said, Chef, uh, as as a woman, how do you um, <laughs> how do you uh, uh, act and behave uh, account uh, accountably uh, in your work for MPV? Yeah. Thank you, Chuck and, uh, and Emiliana and Omer. Thank you uh, for sharing your honest reflections and experience, experiences in doing the work that you do. And even I, as a woman, need to walk the talk. And uh, especially in how I act and behave accountably in my work, in also holding men accountable. So as a human rights defender, as a Muslim woman, as a feminist, what do I actually do? Well, again, it starts with education. And I'm going to share my screen again if all goes well there we go uh so we'll just make that full screen there we go um so again it starts with 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 education and prior to starting uh my position with mpv i had to delve deeper in learning more about islam and particularly on what for example the quran says and on the historical and man-made origins of is islamic jurisprudence and the patriarchal underpinnings of traditions. So for me, it was particularly important to understand Islam for myself so that I am able to debunk stereotypes on Islam that are perpetuated in the media and by Muslim extremists and through Islamophobic narratives. So for instance, as I mentioned before, it starts with uh, education and I had to educate myself a little bit further on the distinction between Sharia and Sharia law. Because uh, that was that's oftentimes um, the base for much discrimination against women that is being perpetuated by men. So if we look a little bit further, I'll give you a little bit insight on our work. Sharia is uh, literally means the path to be followed, the right path. So you can think of it as the path path to to quench your spiritual thirst. And the sources of this path are uh, the Quran and the authentic traditions of uh, the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, these are immutable. But on the other hand, if we look at Sharia law, Sharia law is based on fiqh. And fiqh is the method by which the law is derived and applied and literally means the understanding. Uh, so that's what ba what's the basis of Sharia law. And, and fiqh, which can be used as a Sharia law interchangeably, is not wholly divine or immutable and is subject to change. So in that sense, Sharia law, which is also coined as Islamic law, is a codification of men, of human understanding of Sharia. Again, Sharia is divine. Um, and the definitions and whatnot you can see up here. And it means that legislation that resulted from man-made interpretations of the Quran and the authentic traditions of the Prophet. So given that Sharia law is a product of interpretation, it, it often differs from across Muslim majority countries and the way it's been applied in society. So therefore, in, in learning this, I found that there's no excuse to not subject Sharia law to amendments according to international human rights law and such uh, women's rights law. 
So another uh, example of uh, when I, as a human rights defender, working to hold uh, human rights violations, working to work um, to hold human rights violators accountable, uh, where I needed to act uh, in an accountable manner by seeking more knowledge is, for example, stoning. And you may have a recent case in the news uh, where a 19-year-old woman named Rakshana was uh, stoned in the Gore province in Afghanistan. And I actually just recently found out that, for instance, under no circumstances uh, the Quran um, uh, established the death penalty of stoning as a form of punishment for adultery. It may be prohibited in the uh, adultery may be prohib prohibited in the Quran, but there's no such punishment of, of stoning. So uh, any Sharia law uh, or legislation stipulating such punishments for adultery are not founded in the Quranic scripture, but are rather drawn from hadith reports which are debatable in authenticity and value. So hadith reports to clarify are, um, are a collection of sayings and traditions of the Prophet Muhammad, which were recorded centuries after his death. So as a result, the authenticity of some hadith references is often questioned, uh, and particularly as uh, some references may contradict the spirit of the Quran, which is love, justice, mercy, and compassion for all. So these two examples of where I needed to uh, take the responsibility to educate myself more about in the intersections of Islam and women's rights uh, in order to help myself with my work to hold violators of women's rights accountable. So how we act and behave accountable in our work is related to how we act and behave in our personal life as well, because that seeking knowledge obviously influences my personal life as well. So there's a responsibility that all of us carry in breaking down stereotypes and debunking har harmful cultural practices. Moreover, again, I'm going to uh, come back with, uh, with a quote from Malala. When the whole world uh, is silent, even one voice becomes powerful. So it's important that we all take the responsibility in calling out injustices when we see them. Thank you. Right. Uh, and, and thank you for that uh, a, amazing um, presentation, Chef. Uh, I think it's um, it, I really highlighted the, like I said before, this this personal sentiment that um, I think is is very important for us as advocates and uh, activists for gender equality to exhibit and exude and really portray uh, to to our constituents, our clients, um, to our demographics. Um, so uh, uh, moving on. Um, uh, I, I do want to pose this question to to the panelists, um, and and we can start with uh, um, Chuck again. Um, how how do you uh, help hold other men accountable um, in your work, uh, and and particularly um, uh, uh, your work in, um, uh, to, or if you could exemplify your work in Minnesota um, with. Um, yeah, uh, which uh, programs and initiatives that you have, have done there, um, Chuck. Uh, you're on mute, Chuck. Thank you. I think there's this ongoing process of accountability and so it happens both individually and institutionally. And so individually, if I'm going to hold a man accountable, uh, basically what I do is talk with him. And uh, so I'll share some stuff about both. This is what we'll do in Minnesota and also on some global levels as well. So I want to share with you the Men Engage Global Alliance um, guide on uh, accountability. But mostly I'm going to approach that individual and, and, and talk with them and share, them my, share my concern and actually help them think about um, how they can address it appropriately. Uh, and I know that it's not an easy process for either the person confronting another or the person being confronted, but it can be a very powerful process of of really, if we're in this together as allies, how do we think together and how do we work through this in a way uh, compassionately looking for uh, a resolution? And how do we uh, stop that behavior, apologize for it, acknowledge it, and then make the amends that are, that are um, needed? So it depends on the incident and where it took place and the context of the incident and the seriousness of the offense, right? I'll usually look at a personal and private conversation first. And then if that... Uh, 
does not resolve the issue. Then I start thinking and talking to my colleagues about and, and uh, confidants about how do you think I should go forward with this? Uh, should I make it public? Um, should I bring it to the board? Should I bring it to a supervisor? Right? I know that in, in institutionally, in a workplace, um, we have policies and protocols that identify particular behaviors that are expected, um, expectations and principles that are asked to be followed. And if those are not followed, then we have a process that says you talk to that individual uh, directly. If it doesn't change, then you talk to the supervisor, right? And then institutionally, there is um, disciplinary processes that are in place on paper that are really clear about what the process is and what it will be um, to go forward. Now, with the Global Men Engage Alliance, I'm going to share you a, a screen with you uh, regarding um, uh, a really good, what I think is a really good um, a guide. They have the, the Global Men Engage Alliance Accountability Standards and Guidelines, and then also have the Men Engage Alliance Accountability Toolkit. And this really lays out what's the code of conduct that's expected. And this is the North American Men Engage Network also have, uh, and you'll see on our website, that we have a list of principles that we uh, go by and also a code of conduct that we accepted and signed on to from the Global Men Engage Alliance. And so we've got things on paper that are really concrete that say these are the expectations of our behaviors. We agree with these principles. We agree with these behaviors that we'll follow through with. And then if they are not followed through with or there's some breach of those um, contracts and, and expectations, then others can challenge us, right? And we're opening that as part of the principles that we're open to that challenge. And that it's important that we be open to that challenge. The, the guidebook um, also talks about the guidance, the Men Engage uh, Global Alliance uh, Standards, Accountability Standards Guidebook also talks about what are the processes institutions can take when accountability comes to the fore? How do you vet it? Who, who's a part of the committee that looks at the incident and makes determinations about the seriousness of the incident and what would be an appropriate resolution? Uh, do you bring the parties together or do you not? Uh, depends on the circumstances. And it really lays it out in some fairly good detail. It's a great model to begin with. The last thing I'll say too is that they also have a toolkit for training men. And I think particularly we're looking at pro-feminist men's organizations or networks of organizations who really want to do this well, who are really committed to doing this well. And we have now we have a toolkit um, that's available, a tool we can use and download from the website that actually we can engage men in an ongoing process like a multiple sessions. Um, uh, around accountability and what that looks like and really strengthening our commitments to accountability. And I think in the next, I'll, I'll stop there and then I'll, I'll speak a little bit more about some specific kinds of ways in which this is looking uh, in more detail on a global level and, uh, and regional level uh, later. Thank you. I'll get off this screen here. Omero, I can't hear you. You're on mute oh, as well. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, is it okay now? Uh, okay, that's good. Um, so yeah, uh, like I said, thank you, thank you uh, very much for that, uh, Chuck. And I, moving on to Emiliano, um, I, I pose the same question to you. Um, uh, how do you help hold other men accountable in your work and your initiatives? Um, what sort of programs uh, have uh, your organization designed to facilitate this, and uh, so on? So please. Thank you. I appreciate that, Chuck. Um, you know, I, I think I think for, for us, uh, for for men who who are doing this work specifically here in Texas, uh, it requires a tremendous amount of uh, relationship building, um, and we're very intentional about that. Um, really reaching out to men who are new to the work, either as staff of a rape crisis center or who um, are joining some local prevention effort, or really reaching out to them and and nurturing those relationships. Um, and engaging in one-on-one -on -one conversations with them throughout uh, as, as they're moving through the work and as they're learning and, and, and uh, kind of checking with them uh, throughout um, their professional or volunteer work um, at the local level. Um, I, I think that's key in terms of the relationship building that we do with men um, who, who want to be a part of the work, who, who are engaged in the work and who do this work professionally. I, I think relationship building is a key so that when Chuck earlier said, um, in terms of having that one-on-one -on -one conversation, that relationship already exists and it's easy for us to approach them and, and to engage in, in sometimes these very difficult 
um, but important conversations, right? These are these are conversations that we cannot avoid. And, and I've had my sh my fair share of uh, positive and negative experiences around trying to hold men accountable, um, as well as being ac accountable myself. And, and I think it's important to acknowledge that that those conversations always don't go very well, um, and that they don't always have the outcome that we hope for. Um, uh, but I, but I think it's important that we engage in the conversation. Uh, that there's a willingness on our part to engage in that conversation, and that um, because I, I think it's it's part of being also accountable to the women um, who I, I work for, who who are my partners in this work, who I um, you know who are, are sort of doing the work on, on the front lines every day, and I and I think um, you know it's it's figuring out how to how to. Uh, what are some of the things that we need to have in place to ensure that these conversations can exist in a, in a safe way, uh, especially for women who have been act impacted by um, our behavior. Um, and, and I think that's, you know, sort of the work that we do at a statewide level is really like Jackson was saying in terms of helping organizations develop policies and procedures to respond uh, to, to hold uh, specifically men accountable for the work that they're doing and, and when they engage in, in problematic behaviors. Um, and so we work as a coalition in providing that ongoing training and technical assistance around those issues and help folks develop those, uh, those policies and those procedures. I think that's an important part of the work. Um, and then once we have really effective models that, that we can, uh, we want to share with our other members and, and really sort of apply and, and uh, what are the lessons that we've learned from the, the successes and the failures around accountability, um, I think those are really key. Um, and I don't know that I have a perfect, you know, that there is a perfect model out there. Um, I, I haven't found it yet. Um, and in the, the many years that I've been doing this work, I, I, I think there's um, each situation, I, I think, is, is really different. And we need to be, uh, you know, our responses need to be flexible and appropriate and uh, well-timed. And um, I think that's sort of what I've learned um, from my work uh, around holding um, both at, as an organ as being part of an organization as well as an institution like a, a sexual assault coalition holding those men accountable is that um, I, I you know I don't think there is one way um, and I, I think we really need to, um, to to learn and listen to what what folks are doing what has been effective for women who have been doing this work uh, longer than we have as men uh, we have to acknowledge their history and their experience um, and, and really value and, and um, because they have been the ones holding us accountable um, from the very beginning. And, um, you know, I think there, there clearly are lessons learned and, and some effective strategies that we can take away from, from them. But um, I think we just need to, uh, again, continue to reflect and write and uh, listen, listen to women um, in terms of what their experiences are, what has been effective and try to apply that to the, to, to the best of our ability. Um, but acknowledge that there are going to be challenges, there are going to be failures, and, and unfortunately, uh, I've seen a lot of men who have engaged in that behavior um, here in Texas, and where we try to, as a community, um, hold that individual accountable, and, and rather than that, uh, the, the, the willingness on his part to accept that accountability and um, to be responsible for his behavior um, and to change his behavior, it's, it's had the opposite effect and, and we've lost the, the you know he's he, he he wasn't able to continue doing the work because he just wasn't there wasn't a willingness on his part um but again i, I think if if for me and for the, the work that we're doing here at tasa through the network i think is really about developing relationships and about um you know ongoing conversation and, and dialogue whether that's again one-on-one -on -one conversations that we're having or collectively as uh, uh, with those organizations. So going to rape crisis centers and working with them around their programmatic work and helping them develop those policies and procedures to effectively respond to, uh, to, to boys and men who are engaging in problematic work. I think that's important. And then how do we, how do we support that at sort of at a statewide level? How do we continue this conversation going through, whether it's through webinars, uh, whether it's through our blog posts, our newsletter, um, all of our statewide sort of prevention training that we're doing, that this continues to be um, central to the, to the work that we're doing and that, um, you know, we invite sort of different voices uh, to, to be a part of those conversations. 
Right. Um, I think you've hit very well on the nail. Um, an issue that uh, a lot of our organizations face, um, is especially when we contextualize accountability um, in all of its dimensions to our work uh, in our individual organizational capacities, um, and that is that there is no one size fits all. That um, men are uh, <laughs> very diverse across uh, uh, domestic and international landscapes, and it's going to require um, a bit of finesse and uh, uh, ongoing dialogue. And, and this webinar is very much a part of that. Um, it's also going to require space and um, strategy. So um, that being said, Shaf, how how do uh, you in your work for MPV um, uh, sort of help? men establish a sense of, of accountability? Uh, what sort of structures or initiatives, paradigms? Thanks, Amir. Um, I'll, build a, I'll, I'll build on what Emiliano was talking about in terms of engaging uh, men in the conversation, and particularly uh, I'll focus on religious men. So given that we are a faith-based human rights organization, MPV is often confronted by patriarchal interpretations of Islamic tradition on a daily basis. Uh, the domain of religious leadership is still largely controlled by men, and it's primarily men who occupy positions of leadership and have control over interpretations. So this doesn't mean that women in Muslim communities are or should be passive. To the contrary, there is a growing movement worldwide of Islamic feminists, which include scholars and activists who live breed and, and promote the idea of gender equality as part and parcel of uh, the Quranic notion of equality between uh, of all human beings. And uh, particularly Islamic feminists who call for the implementation of gender equality uh, in the state uh, via civil society uh, institutions or civil institutions and everyday life. So what is key with Islamic feminism is that it uses Islamic theology as the root uh, of the inspiration for gender equality. And a key uh, organization in doing that is uh, an organization that was based in Malaysia, uh, whose name is Musawa. So we use that scholarly work uh, produced by Islamic feminists in holding men accountable. For example, in breaking down uh, verse 434 of the Quran, and for those that that don't know, first uh, 434 of the Quran is infamously known uh, to legitimate, legitimize male guardianship and uh, also domestic violence within Muslim communities. And we, uh, as a result of the work that Islamic feminists have done, they have, for instance, been able to uh, demonstrate that the, one of the key words in Arabic that has caused so much controversy, the word daraba in Arabic can, instead of being uh, translated as beating lightly, can be interpreted as walk away, which is a whole new different ball game and, kind, uh, and debunks the, the justification for domestic violence. So yet as much as we are promoting such feminist interpretations of the quran and supporting the work of islamic feminists and we realize that it's so powerful we realize as well that we can't do this women's empowerment work alone and we desperately need uh, to engage religious leaders so uh, muslim community leaders and imams uh, to not only inform them about international women's rights but then to also engage them in debunking misogynist interpretation of islamic tradition. So yes, of course, there's many, there are many uh, imams who perpetuate misogynist interpretations of the Quran and Islamic traditions. But we have also seen uh, the need to recognize that there are many imams who are true advocates of women's rights. And uh, all they need is a little boost and a little support and recognition so that they feel empowered to carry on their good work in women's empowerment, but also that their voices become um, the dominant, the, uh, the dominant narrative, and and uh, and a byproduct for, uh, of that, uh, of course, is that we are able to then counter Islamophobia in a sense of showcasing positive stories about Islam. So, no, not all uh, imams of uh, or Muslim men beat their wives or seek to marry off their daughters at the age of fourteen. Many do want their children, of course, and wives to flourish in life and and encourage them to pursue their education. So. Based on this, uh, an early, uh, an early um, uh, 
in March 2015, we launched an initiative called uh, Imam Sushi, and I'm going to share again in my screen with you to kind of give you a little bit of a run through of what this initiative actually entails. So bear with me as I'm setting up this Prezi again. Um, there, let's allow this. There we go. So, uh, in, so we launched this initiative called Imam Sushi, which is inspired by the UN Women's Campaign of He for She. And uh, the Imam Sushi initiative seeks to support and empower Imams, religious leaders, Islamic scholars, who we like to call Imam Sushi. And they debunk misogynist interpretations of Islamic scripture that have led to human rights violations in the name of Islam um, against women and girls in Muslim majority countries. So. Who do we define to be um, imams for Shi? And we have this on our website as well. So if I go through this too quickly for the sake of time, uh, feel free to browse our website as well. So first and foremost, um, imams for Shi are those that follow Prophet Muhammad's lead by advocating for women's rights. So this may be a shocking new fact, but Prophet Muhammad was indeed a feminist as he gave women many rights at his uh, time already. And uh, Imams for Shi uh, champions are also individuals who debunk patriarchal and misogynist interpretations of the Quran and the Hadith. They lead their Muslim communities to embrace uh, gender equality, gender parity. Uh, they also declare all these uh, forms of violence against women uh, and girls to be un-Islamic. So that includes acid attacks, domestic violence and assaults honor killings, female infanticide, female genital mutilation and cutting, also known as FGMC, and all forms of child and forced marriages, uh, sexual violence, sexual harassment and assault and trafficking, and the list goes on and on and on and on. And in terms of, of a conflict setting, so for example, in situations of Boko Haram or in uh, cases of ISIS or whatnot, they would denounce all forms of violence against women and girls in conflict, including sexual and gender-based violence, sexual enslavement and child uh, soldiering, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they also encourage the full participation and leadership uh, in the mosque. And this may seem very, you know, as if that's, that's common sense, but even that needs to be highlighted again. Uh, women's full participation at home, um, in the workforce, uh, in the public sphere, and in politics. And last but definitely not least, that they empower men and women alike to reach their full potential through complete access to education. So that's a little bit of who Imam Sushi actually are. And um, why is this important? Well, if we look at a report recently of the Special Rapporteur on uh, Freedom of Religion and Belief, he had noted that countless examples demonstrate that violence in the name of religion especially displays a, a pronounced ge uh, gender dimension. And this you can see in the following examples. So, for example, and the sources are all listed here, one in five mim women, uh, one in five, um, one in five girls in the MENA region are married off before the age of 18. Uh, it's, an, it's estimated that uh, 100 million uh, to 140 million girls and women alive today experience some form of FGMC, female genital mutilation and cutting. And interestingly enough, 14 countries in the MENA region are in the bottom 20 of the Global Gender Gap Index uh, ranking of 2014. And according to UN Women, and I'm sure all of us are aware of this statistic already, one in three women worldwide ha have uh, experienced physical or sexual violence. So these are just some, some facts to, to, and statistics to throw out there. So. And here are some, some photos of the Imam Sushi initiative. And um, we, we recognize that it's, uh, that Imams have a broad influence in Muslim majority countries around the world. And their support is crucial in promoting gender equality and preventing violence against women and girls. And we also know that many Imams ha are already advocating for gender parity and they themselves are often ostracized and ridiculed by more radical Imams for their alternative or alternate views. So MPV believes that it's crucial to empower these Imams for Shi by providing them with positive uh, public support as well as educational training materials uh, with which they promote their message and, 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 and such. So 
we believe uh, that violence can only be eradicated when once uh, mindsets are changed. And uh, one of the ways that we do that is by transforming societal norms through the community authority. So for example, Imams for Shi with workshops and consultations um, and that they will collaborate through peer-to-peer cross-regional learning approaches to produce counter narratives in combating violence against women in the name of Islam. And another way uh, that we do that is kind of like a bottom-up approach. Shaf, are you still there? Uh, I think we might have lost her. Mm. Okay, let's see if I can. Has her video feed stopped for everyone else? Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay, so let me see where. She could be if I could get to her Gmail. While you're doing that, Omer, yeah. I just, I really, and I'll stop as soon as she gets back on. It just mm -hmm. really like the fact that she's re, uh, looking at the religious community and the yeah. how the interpretation of the Quran. And that's there's a lot of sim. I was raised a Catholic and Christian community, and really a lot of similarities about the uh, uh, interpretation of the Bible and how that's used to oppress women. And I like mm -hmm. her thing about Muhammad being a feminist, because sometimes I'll speak about Jesus being a radical feminist. Mm -hmm. If you look at the New Testament and the Christian uh, ideologies and religion, um, the stories about the women, he was he was radical towards women around justice mm -hmm. and uh, respect. And so I really like this, this, this method of changing community norms. Right. Uh, and I mean, fundamentally, I think one chef would, um, uh, I was alluding to is that um, these uh, tribal leaders, these religious leaders in, in uh, Muslim majority communities at the grassroots level have such an influence on the hearts and minds of their communities. So um, this is, uh, I mean, if you look at it anthropologically, it makes perfect sense for um, uh, uh, a solution to come or be born, a sort of, I guess I would use the word indigenously here. Um, within a community for the community, uh, as opposed to, let's say, a, a an outside or a, 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 a sort of a ethic or um, yeah, outside perspective uh, of uh, rights or um, advocacy or, or even accountability, because I mean that's something like we had to do earlier means something very different to uh, different communities across the globe. Um, so I have just emailed Shaf. I know it's probably not the best way to get in touch with her uh, as quickly as possible, uh, but uh, um, we'll we'll see if uh, she gets back on. We can continue her her presentation, um, or she can just wrap that up very quickly and say a few last words about it. Um, but I guess uh, for the sake of time, we'll we'll move on. Um, and um, we'll we'll continue with uh, the discussion. So our last uh, question for for the panelists I have here um, it's a bit of a philosophical question. Um, oh, Shaf is back. Okay, great. So good thing before I, I ask the last question. Um, so Shaf, was there any? Did you want to wrap up very quickly um, what you were saying, um, and then we'll move on. I wasn't quite sure at what point I was cut off, but um, okay. I wanted to invite everyone, just for the sake of time, to uh, to view our website, I guess, uh, www.mpvusa.org slash imams for she, if you want to know. Uh, um, <laughs> well, Chef, if you can hear me, you're, you're, uh, you're freezing again. So... How about if you can hear me, just hop on uh, again, but maybe close your video feed if that would help uh, the connection. Um, so I think we'll we'll continue. Um, our website, by the way, is uh, www.mpvusa.org um, and uh, has 
uh, all of our materials and our resources, links to external um, resources and materials that you could um, uh, take a look at. Um, uh, that would, I, I guess, sort of uh, better flesh out our position on, on gender equality, women's empowerment, and engaging men in this discussion. Um, so as I was saying earlier, I think uh, we'll move on. And um, our last uh, uh, point here, our last question, uh, I guess, for our panelists is, um, like I said, very philosophical, uh, uh, very um, uh, makes, your, uh, makes you think a little bit. But um, I think it's an important one nonetheless, um, after, especially after all of this talk of uh, sort of our, our uh, pragmatic approaches to this, to the issue, and, and a lot of the work that we've been doing. Um, but the question is, um, who are you accountable to? Uh, um, and, and how do you respond to be, being held accountable? Um, so Emiliano, if we could have your thoughts. Um, thank you. So, uh, you know, I think one of the things I said earlier, I'm really accountable to, uh, especially women of color who invited me into the work and um, who uh, I'm very fortunate to work with and, and learn from and um, are really true mentors um, and the work that I do. Um, so for me, you know, women um, of color, um, you know, women in general, I think women who, uh, again, who are in, in positions of leadership, who, who are doing the work every day um, uh, around the state and the country, who have led these efforts from the very beginning. Um, so, so for me, you know, that's, that's where my accountability sort of lives. But, but I think, um, you know, we, I, I don't know that men necessarily that are coming into the work share that sort of uh, that value uh, or the importance of, of accountability in, in the same ways. And, I, and again, I did not come to this sort of realization overnight. And, and I think this was definitely a process for me and that, I, that I'm still very much in. And I think for men who, 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 are, who want to do the work, I, I think we have to find out and ask who, who am I accountable and, and, um, and really invite women to create that, uh, that community of accountability for them. Um, and that we hopefully will find men who will also be part of that, that broader community of accountability. And, and um, you know, I, th I think it's, for me, it's really effective to know that, that there is a community of account accountability around me um, sort of from the very beginning of my work and, and that I value and, and um, appreciate that sort of feedback um, that they, that those individuals have, those women, pr primarily women of color have given me in terms of feedback and guidance and, and, and challenged me and really hold, has, you know, have held me accountable. Um, and I want to be continuously open to that and to be responsible and responsive to, uh, to those women, um, especially women who identify as survivors. I think for, for us as a coalition, we are accountable to that community of survivors uh, here in Texas uh, of sexual assault and to all survivors. Um, and again, women who, who are doing primarily the prevention work around the state, who are primarily serving on board of directors, who are primarily volunteering, who are primarily working as professionals in this work. And um, I am accountable to all of those folks. And so I want that entire community to, to engage with me in dialogue and to hold me accountable and uh, invite the folks on this webinar as well as the folks in, in, in those communities to, to hold me accountable. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, unfortunate uh, men are engaging in this work and, and, and they're saying or doing things, especially on social media, where we as men are not calling them out and not holding them accountable. Um, and when women do, who are primarily being responsive and trying to hold men accountable for things to say or do on social media that are problematic and abusive and violent, um, those men uh, just ratchet up the violence and abuse. And um, I think it's a, it's a it's an important conversation that we need to have is about sort of our role and our responsibility of holding men accountable on social media and how do we ensure that we're engaging in a conversation that is really responsive to uh, to those different platforms and uh, to men who who um, who, are, who are doing things that are very problematic um, and, I, and I think it's sort of a, a, a place where we as men are not doing enough that women have been historically around social media doing that work and trying to hold men accountable for things to say and do um, on social media. Um, 
Uh, so I think that's an important conversation that we need to continue to have with each other and uh, that we need to have in these sort of spaces, uh, these types of uh, conversations and webinars. But um, I know that, um, you know, I wouldn't be open to that. And I, and, and I think that, um, again, hopefully this conversation will be ongoing, that we don't have to stop here and that uh, we will continue to reflect and, and explore this issue together. Um, and really think about what works and what doesn't work, because what works for men of color um, might not work for other other folks um, in, in our in our communities. And I and I think it's important to understand that there are real uh, ex there are differences in experiences. Because when we think about accountability, we also think about uh, you know calling the police or intervening um, and firing that individual. Or um, so I think there are again accountability looks different for different folks in different communities and, and I think we have to ask folks in those communities uh, what accountability should look like and, and what is what are some of the practices of, of accountability um, and I think we should respect those those systems of accountability that folks create for themselves and um, and of course I think there are things that we should model and practice that are sort of best best practices around accountability but we we also again, need to be flexible and, and responsive to, uh, to the needs of different groups of folks and, and different communities. Right. Uh, I, I think you've hit, once again, so eloquently uh, right on the nail, the, this, this fact of, um, or this idea of not one size fits all, when, especially when we're talking about our communities uh, and the communities that we work with. Um, but, but also, you know, the fact, uh, you, you've highlighted so well here, um, agency, uh, and, and, and the fact that it is, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of the responsibility of, of a man and our, especially of, of the work that of advocates and activists such as ourselves, uh, to make agents, uh, the communities and, and the individuals that we work with so that, um, you know, they can exercise their own uh, uh, senses of accountability and uh, so that, you know, we aren't imposing our own ideas, but um, sort of adapting them. Um, so Chuck, do you uh, have a few uh, words to say about this? Uh, who, uh, who are you being held accountable by and, and how do you um, uh, um, hold yourself uh, accountable? Uh, well, I agree with much of what Emiliano was saying. Um, so I see myself accountable predominantly to those most harmed, and in this case, talking about uh, all women, uh, particularly women of color and, and Native American women, and then uh, poor women, right? Uh, but all women in general. And then also, if I'm working in al as allies with men, other pro-feminist men around this, um, then how am I accountable to men, as a white man to men of color or, or Native men or uh, LGBTQ allies, right? And so how do I bring my other type race privileges into the, or, or um, my sexual orientation privileges into that, into that arena as well. So all of that um, matters. Uh, one of the things that's interesting to me is who am I accountable to? Well, what if these folks don't agree? So what if the feminist uh, women's movement, women's rights movements don't agree on a particular issue like, let's say, sex trafficking or prostitution? or sex work. So even those three words alone create uh, quite a bit of, uh, suggests a philosophical underpinning of how I think about um, prostitution. So there's a very, I think this is a good example of accountability for pro-feminist men's groups and networks, is that there's a real divide globally around um, prostitution and how to respond to it. Everyone has the same intent around reducing the harm, but we have different kinds of levels of uh, strategies. One primarily separated between the decriminalization of prostitution or the legalization of prostitution and the Nordic model. And I'm in a, a global network who does not have a position yet on this because it's so um, difficult. And people are coming together compassionately about this, about how, wh which strategies should we support and rather than as a men's uh, pro-feminist privileged men's organization, rather than sit quietly by and do nothing and have no position, we're advocating and actually moving towards creating a position uh, and we will not get consensus on this because we have strong disagreements about uh, which of these models is most effective and most important for, for addressing gender equity and respect and, and justice and harm. Uh, but if we are transparent, and we reveal both these positions, 
and we say these are counter positions and we have disagreements about this and this is one position and this is the other position and this is why we feel this way, then our allies globally can look at us, those who are most harmed by this uh, sexist oppression can look at us, read what our position is transparently and they can have an informed decision now about whether they will ally with us, whether they will support us or whether they will do joint partnerships with us. And so I think the transparency, uh, this is a good example of who am I accountable to, and I think that we will, we do have to choose at times, and who do we choose, and how do we make that choice, and then how do we, how are we transparent about that choice, I think is the critical accountability piece. Secondarily, there has been instances in this country and others, of course, where you have or men's, uh, pro-feminist men's organizations who have come under fire from uh, feminist women's organizations. And uh, sometimes we'll get a list of here's the here's the perception of what occurred, and then here's what we'd like you to do do to make amends. And I think it's critical that we respond to let's say someone sends us a ten point piece of what how what we want you to do to respond. I think it's critical as a pro feminist men's organization that we respond to each of those demands, and we say yes, we agree with your perception, and we agree to change. No, we disagree with your perception. This is why. Or yes, we agree with your perception, but we will not meet this demand in its entirety. We'll go 75%, but we won't go the 25. And then we explain why. Again, that we are being transparent and we're being out there um, uh, explaining uh, our positions and what we are willing and not willing to do. And then people can, women's organizations and women's rights organizations and others can look, up, look at us and make a decision whether we are safe to align with and whether we have the credibility that we purport to have, uh, and people can make those decisions. And I think this is a critical safety issue that as men um, in this movement uh, or any other privileged class who is a part of a, a system of harm, that we need to be as transparent and, and as accountable, meaning we need to attend to each of these requests by those who are most harmed, and then they can decide and others can decide whether in fact we're good allies. Thanks. Uh, and thank you, Chuck. That was an uh, excellent um, answer. Uh, and, and so, Chef, um, I think we'll move on to you. Uh, for the sake of time, if we could keep um, the, the answer maybe to about two minutes, and then we can um, have it about maybe a one minute closing remarks from all of the panelists afterward. Chef? Sure. I hope that uh, internet doesn't cut out, so apologies for that. I'm accountable to my fellow human beings and all the actions that I, uh, that I have, and I affect my uh, community and, and the world and the planet. So I feel a particular responsibility to young women. And in, to give you a little anecdotal story, I recently met up with an imam who proudly identifies himself as an imam for she, and therefore he's an imam who actively promotes women's rights and, and women's empowerment. And digging a little bit deeper, I wanted to know, substantially speaking, what he thought about uh, violence against women and, and girls and regarding discrimination against women and girls. And he responded that he just, defi he just defines it to be domestic violence. So I asked him, you know, what do you think about early enforced marriage? He said, no, that's not a, f a form of, of violence against women or discrimination against women and girls. So then I had to school this, this well-learned man who knows so much about Islam of, hey, you know, early enforced marriage are, is not an Islamic tradition. It's not Islamic at all. So sometimes you need to st speak truth to power and sometimes... Uh, choose your battles, of course, but uh, challenge these authority figures on on knowledge that you assume that they know. So, in addition, I asked him again, you know, whether he viewed FGMC as a, a form of violence against women, and he didn't believe that practice was a form of, of, of violence against women. And then I had to go through all the nitty gritty, uh, harmful um, uh, consequences of FGMC again schooling this this man who I assumed knew that this is a form of violence against women. So it's important to school yourself sometimes first so that you can then speak truth to power. Absolutely. And I, I, this, I think, is once again, highlights a point that we're, uh, you know, we keep coming back to and that um, accountability is different uh, all across the board and who you are responsible for and who you are will be held accountable by and who you're accountable to is, are all very um, different and uh, diverse. Um, so 
We are going to wrap up uh, this webinar with about one, one minute closing remarks from the panelists. But I also want to remind all of our viewers um, that we, we're also looking for uh, soliciting ideas for future webinars. Um, so during this, this last, a few, the last two minutes, uh, if you could just funnel us some ideas um, or uh, um, topics that you'd like to see discussed, it would be much appreciated. Um, so Emiliano, I think we'll, we'll finish up uh, with starting with you. If you have any last minute remarks. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for, for moderating this discussion for all the panelists and, and um, for naming for hosting this particular webinar. Um, I did want to encourage folks, if folks are really interested in, in continuing these conversations, hopefully we'll continue to engage each other through Twitter using the hashtag Naaman. Um, also want to encourage folks, if you're interested, we have an upcoming webinar uh, specifically about um, engaging men in violence prevention in rural communities. So if that's something you're trying to look at, I hope you can join us for that. You can go to tasa.org to register for that webinar. That's going to be uh, next Monday at this at this time from 12 to 1.30. So hopefully folks can join us for that. I, I did want to encourage folks, I think, you know, this is this has been a, a, a really important resource for me in, in terms of my own development and thinking about accountability and hearing the voices of, of, of marginalized folks, uh, especially women and um, Voicemail has been a really important publication for me, and I think it's an ongoing theme of, of this publication. I want to encourage folks to pick it up. It's a national quarterly publication, and I think it's a tremendous resource uh, to continue, not just explore this issue, but a, a range of issues around healthy masculinity. So I want to encourage folks to do that. I think one of the things for me when I first started doing this work, uh, one of the first, the first books that I read was Men's Work by Paul Kivel, um, which I think really centers um, accountability um, and his work, and uh, really found that to be very profound and really has helped inform um, my work. Um, and so I would encourage folks to, to really uh, to consider picking that up, uh, especially folks, especially men who are new to the work. Um, but I, I think, you know, hopefully this is something that will continue, that Naaman will continue to facilitate these conversations and that we will continue to engage in conversations and, and share experiences around accountability. And I think uh, I'm open to, to folks um, hearing feedback from folks uh, about anything I've said or, or done um, or my work moving forward, but um, I appreciate the opportunity to, to, to engage in this conversation uh, with all of you today. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much, Emiliano, and a uh, pleasure to have you here and uh, for you to share your experience and your work. Um, Shafran, if you just want to wrap up um, a few, uh, maybe 30 seconds, if sure. you could do that. Sure. Two takeaway points to read. Uh, hold yourself accountable first and foremost. If you're confronted with injustice, particularly being uh, those being justified in the name of religion, whatever religion that may be, seek knowledge. Read more. Don't take the mainstream interpretation as the one and only answer, particularly if such interpretation contradicts the essence of love and justice and, and compassion for all human beings, which all, hu all religions have. And second, Ask questions, ask religious leaders tough questions, hold them accountable. The only way that we can debunk misogynist interpretations of scripture is through discussion and amongst ourselves, but also in consultation with religious leaders. And I have a request for you all, all the, the viewers, if you have, if you know of any um, individuals who could be uh, identified as Imams Fashi, please do send those to us uh, through our email, info at mpvusa.org. Uh, and um, yeah, we'll be more than happy to work alongside them to uh, empower women across the world. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, very powerful uh, closing remarks, Chef. Um, and Chuck, uh, we'll move on to you. So very, very quickly, if you can serve over 10. 15 seconds. <laughs> uh, accountability is action, period, action. Silence is consent. There's no neutral position here around sexism. You can't be quietly sitting by as a man. I used to talk to men and I'd have guys come up after presentation and says, Chuck, you should be talking to the guys who are abusive and beating and raping women. Not You kind of talk to the choir here. And I said, no, I, I want to talk to the choir. That's what I want to talk to because I want them to start singing. Accountability is part of that song. Thanks. Excellent. Excellent way to end the webinar. Thank you for that, Chuck. Um, and uh, I would like to thank um, Alan and, and our panelists, Emiliano, Shafran, and, and Chuck, and we have all of their information available. Um, and thank you all viewers for funneling your ideas. And uh, I'll leave it to Alan now to close the webinar.
Thanks, Omar. Thank you very much for facilitating this discussion today, and thank you, panelists, um, Shafron, Emiliano, and Chuck. Your comments were uh, so helpful and um, educational, and so we really appreciate your willingness to spend this hour and a half with us. And to those who are participating and as viewers today, this uh, webinar has been recorded, and there will be a link on the North American Men Engaged website for uh, that link to be uh, used or to be shared with your colleagues and or uh, friends in the field. And so we would ask that you uh, please visit the North American Men Engaged website, and we will get that link out um, as soon as we possibly uh, can takes us time to to record and, and finish that technically here. So I want to thank Matthew Tenney for helping provide the technical assistance today and in the, in the University of Northern Iowa Center for Violence Prevention for hosting this. And on behalf of the programming group for the North American Men Engaged, thank you everyone for your participation and we look forward to future webinars together. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. Take care. Take care everyone. Thank you.